Okay, in the previous lecture, we defined some uh, stress measures uh, that we use in continuum mechanics. Uh, I want to I want to now give an example, uh, kind of highlighting the differences, and in particular for the the nominal stress, I want to talk about what it actually is doing. Because um, one thing that I didn't talk about, we we talked about this ta this t naught traction. We didn't really mention what that was in the last lecture, so I want to talk about that. So let's just begin with an example. So we're going to consider an element that's rotating at some constant angular velocity about its origin. Okay, and we can uh, we can describe this motion in terms of the angular velocity omega as follows. So we can write that uh, we we'll just do it in two dimensions. So c1 and c2 uh, is going to be equal to, and then we have this transformation matrix. It looks like cosine of omega t, negative sine of omega t, sine of omega t, and then cosine of omega t. Okay, times our reference coordinates, x1, x2. So that's how we would define um, the motion. Okay, so call that equation one. Now we're going to let the Cauchy stress uh, in some initial state uh, be given as follows. Okay, so we'll say, let's say that sigma uh, evaluated at t equals zero, so that's the initial state, is going to just be equal to, we'll just have normal forces on the, in the x and the y. So we'll call it sigma x, and I'm going to put a zero for naught, that's our initial stress. And we'll call this sigma y naught. So I'm just going to work in two dimensions here, as you can see. Okay, call that equation two. What we're going to do is we're going to assume that this stress state is frozen in space. So the element is just rotating in a rigid body manner. Okay. Okay. So we're going to say that uh, the stress state isn't going to change intrinsically. It's just going to spin, right? According to equation one. So what do we want to find here? Well, let's, let's try to find the nominal stress P and the PK2 stress S. Uh, for both the initial configuration at time t equals zero and uh, some configuration that t is equal to uh, pi over two omega, which would put us at a 90 degree rotation. So what we want to do now is just draw a picture of the initial and the rotated states uh, for our analysis. So let's first draw the initial. Okay, and I'll try to make this a rectangle so we can kind of visually, uh, quickly visually look at uh, X and Y here. So that's our initial state. And let's say that this is our, um, this is our X axis, right? And this is our Y axis. And so off this, we're going to have the initial uh, sigma X naught. Obviously coming off this side, we'll have an equal and opposite force of sigma X naught uh, off the Y. I should have written it more in the center, but you get the idea. Uh, sigma y naught, and coming off of this, sigma y naught. Okay, so that's the initial configuration. What about the rotated configuration? So in the rotated, I'm going to have, I'm going to now have my rectangle looking like this. Okay. Remember, my stress state is frozen in, so I I don't have. Um, uh, I don't need to do anything except rotate the stresses. So now this is going to be sigma y naught. And this will obviously be a positive sigma y naught. And then similarly, sigma x naught here. And then sigma x naught here. But obviously, in this case, that's now our x-axis. And this is our y-axis, right? So we've just spun, we've spun the element in this direction, sort of right? 90 degrees. Okay, so let's go ahead and give our solution. How do we find that? So let's go ahead and first look at the initial state. Okay, well, what happens in the initial state? Let's, we know we're going to need the deformation gradient tensor, right? Which is F is equal to partial C with respect to X, right? Uh, in the initial state, it's basically going to be uh, this f value 
uh, the, the deformation gradient tensor is going to be the value of that uh, sine cosine uh, matrix. Okay, so at the at the value of zero, this is just as the identity matrix, or at the value of t equals zero rather. So we call that just i. Okay, let's call let's call that um, equation three. And now I'm going to just remind you of the relationship that I gave you the last time between the nominal stress p and the Cauchy stress sigma. Right, we said that P was equal to the Jacobian J times F inverse times sigma. Right, let's call that equation four. So let's go ahead and evaluate these terms. Well, we know what J is, right? J is just the determinant of the deformation gradient tensor, right? Which would, I can look at the, and see that that's the identity matrix. So J is just gonna equal one. Uh, which we expect, right? If J is the, the ratio of volumes from the current state to the reference state, and all we have is a rigid body rotation, we don't expect there to be any volume changes. So J equals one uh, is correct. Okay, how about F inverse? Well, it's pretty easy to do an inverse of an identity matrix. It's just the identity matrix. So F inverse is equal to F, right? So then I can just go ahead and substitute. Let's collectively call these equations five. I can substitute these into equation four. Okay, and I end up with that P is equal to, there's one times my identity matrix. Times my identity matrix I uh, times a sigma. I times sigma is just sigma times one is just sigma. So this is equal to sigma. So the upshot here is that my nominal stress tensor is equal to the Cauchy stress in the initial case. Call that equation six. All right, now what we wanna do is we wanna uh, compute the, the second puhl kirchhoff stress, S. Uh, so I'm gonna remind you of the relationship between S and sigma there. Okay, and that said that S was equal to uh, J times F inverse, times sigma times F inverse transpose. Call that equation seven. Okay, so let's look at, so the only thing I need, I've already looked at what J and F inverse are, I just need now F inverse transpose. So uh, just note that, that F uh, inverse transpose is equal to F inverse transpose, which F inverse we already said was the identity matrix. The transpose of the identity matrix is the identity matrix. So this is just the identity matrix. So uh, if I call that equation eight, if you want, so I can go ahead and substitute uh, equations five and eight into equation seven. Okay, and when I do that, I end up with S is equal to one times the identity matrix times times sigma times the identity matrix, which is equal to sigma. So I have, I have said something that's not so interesting yet. I said that the second puhl kirchhoff stress uh, S is equal to the Cauchy stress sigma in the initial state. Okay, call that equation nine. So now let's consider the rotated state. Okay, so that means that T is gonna be equal to pi over to omega. Okay, what happens there? At, at that state, we have the cosine of omega t now looks like the cosine of pi over two, which is 90 degrees and that's zero. And similarly, the sine of omega t uh, equals the sine of pi over two, which equals one, right? So the implication is then that our, our uh, deformation gradient tensor looks like as follows, zero, negative one, one, zero. Okay, let's go ahead and call that equation 10. Also, what can we say? Uh, again, we, we expect that the Jacobian to be one. Turns out the determinant of this, this uh, uh, matrix is also one. And so the Jacobian still remains one in this case, okay? So what is the Cauchy stress here? Well, we can just look at the Cauchy stress and by inspection, write that down. 
So by inspection, uh, the Cauchy stress is given as follows. Right, so we have sigma. And now what do we have in the x direction? Well, we have that sigma y value. So that's just sigma y naught. And then nothing in these shear terms. And then the in the y direction, we have sigma x naught. Right, that's the rotated 90 degrees. Call that equation 11. Now we'll go ahead and compute the nominal stress P using equation 4. We need uh, F inverse here. Um, and you can pretty easily find that the, the inverse of equation 10 is just uh, accomplished by swapping the signs on the 1. So this becomes 0, 1, negative 1, 0. Okay. Call that equation 12. And then we can go ahead and write P. Right, so now P equals 1, that Jacobian value, times F inverse, which we just computed as 0, 1, negative 1, 0, times the Cauchy stress, which we just wrote down was sigma Y naught, 0, 0, sigma X naught. Okay, if I do the matrix multiplication on that, I end up with 0, sigma X naught, uh, negative sigma Y naught, and zero. Okay, call that equation 13. So there we have our a nominal stress tensor. So now let's go ahead and compute the second peel Kirchhoff stress uh, using equation seven. And if we do that, we just we just need one more term to compute. That's F uh, inverse transpose. Um, so we already know F inverse. We take the transpose of that and we end up with zero negative one one, zero, right? Call that equation 14. And then let's go ahead and plug our uh, our values into equation seven. So I'm going to try to make this a little simple, uh, simplified. So this is uh, J times F inverse times sigma times F inverse transpose, right? And I know what this term is, right? That's P. So this is just equal to P times F inverse transpose. So I can compute that. I take uh, that what I just computed for P is zero sigma X naught, negative sigma Y naught, and then zero times the quantity zero, negative one, one, zero. And if I do the matrix multiplication out, I end up with uh, sigma X naught, zero, zero, sigma y naught. Okay, let's call that equation 15. Tried to leave all three stresses here on the screen. So now in the initial case, all three stresses were identical. In this rotated stress, stre uh, rotated state, all three stresses are different, right? So we have the Cauchy stress, which is different than the nominal stress, which is different than the second Peel Kirchhoff stress. Okay, so those are our three different stress uh, tensors that we would calculate from this rigid body rotation of that element. Let me make some remarks. Number one, note that P that we computed in the rotated state was not symmetric. Okay, that's different. Uh, we've mentioned that before that P wasn't necessarily symmetric, but we've never really seen that. So this shows that uh, it doesn't even need deformation, just a rigid body rotation can make uh, P non-symmetric. So why is that? This is because P is what's referred to, so the nominal stress is what's called a two-point tensor. And, and in this case, what we mean by that is that this is, that, that P has one point that's referring to the normal in the reference configuration. And the other is referring to a force in the current configuration. So what do I mean by that? Let me let me remind you of the definition I gave you before. I said that we defined the the nominal stress n naught, right? Dot p the nominal stress, right? Which is uh, times our area d gamma, right? D gamma naught rather. That's our initial area is equal to. And I gave you this term. I said that's t naught times d gamma naught, right? But I didn't really define t naught for you. So what is T naught? And it's sort of a weird thing. It's called a pseudo traction vector. And what does it represent? 
It's the force that's actually acting on the deformed element, but it's on a per unit of the undeformed element area. Okay? So it's the force acting per unit of the undeformed area. Okay, so, so what does that mean? That means that this pseudo force is being multiplied by the original undeformed area to give me the real force. The real force I could write as uh, T d gamma, which, which is our, uh, what we would have in the, in the traction uh, expression for the Cauchy stress, right? So this is the actual force uh, in the deformed uh, element. Okay, but when I multiply n naught times p, I get this this pseudo traction um, that's with respect with ref with reference rather to this undeformed area. Okay, but it's still the true force. So you can see that I have a, a sort of a true force term, or if you want to think of it in this term of a pseudo traction, but it's relating to something in the current, but it's referenced with respect to the reference configuration. So it kind of has its foot in both the reference and the current configuration, which is which makes it messy. Now we can call this equation 16. Okay, so because of that, uh, the, the, because of this two-point nature of the nominal stress, uh, it, we don't usually use it in constitutive equations. Okay, so then you're going, well, why do we use it at all? Well, the reason we use it is that it leads to uh, uh, a nice simplicity of the momentum balance equations and the FEA equations, um, which is why it's still uh, in, in use. Okay, so I'll just say, however, uh, it leads to a simple momentum balance and FEA equations uh, that make it still useful. Okay, before I scroll down to make my second remark, I want you to look at that uh, S in equation 15, the, the second pillow Kirchhoff stress. I want you to note couple things. One is that it looks exactly like the unrotated second pillow Kirchhoff stress, and it's symmetric, okay? So number two, my remarks, uh, is that note that S was, is symmetric, as we said it was, but I just showed it, showed how. Uh, and I'll just say, and uh, for, for a pure rotation, it's capturing the true stress in material coordinates, or rather in the material orientation. Right, so the material orientation being however that material was oriented when I rotated at 90 degrees, the, the orientation of that material rotated 90 degrees, and the, the stress with respect to that material orientation uh, didn't change, and, and the second pillow Kirchhoff stress uh, uh, showed that that didn't change, okay? So it captures true stress in, in, a, in material orientation that's rotating. Okay, and, and what that means here was that the stress remained constant. Okay, so hopefully that uh, gives you a little additional clarity on these measures. Again, we could spend a lot longer um, deriving these things, but and so I don't want you to panic if you still don't feel uh, uh, extremely comfortable with them. I just need you to basically know how to use them. Uh, and, and sort of a little bit about what they're telling us.